You're listening to the Dead Presidents Podcast. And this is the Top 5 Presidential Athletes. Five! Welcome to the Dead Presidents Podcast. I am James J. Hamilton. And I'm Stephen Lincoln Douglas. We got a pretty beefy top five for you this week. Yep, we're going to be dealing with our most vigorous, energetic presidents. That's right. We're going to go into the top five most athletic presidents. Number five. Dwight Eisenhower. As a young man, Eisenhower was very passionate about sports, and the playing field was where he first discovered his talents as a leader. He went to West Point, played college football for the Army. Running back, linebacker, the New York Times described him as one of the most promising backs in Eastern football. In 1912, Army played against Carlisle Indian School, whose star player was Jim Thorpe, who had just won Olympic gold medals in the decathlon and the pentathlon. There was a whole book about this game called Carlisle vs. Army, the forgotten story of football's greatest battle. Eisenhower wanted to hit Thorpe hard and knock him out of the game. He laid a big hit on him, but Thorpe got right up and shook it off. Late in the game, Eisenhower got juked by Thorpe and collided with another Army player, suffering a knee injury that knocked him out of the game, ended his football career, and threatened his military career. Kind of a hairy situation there. Yep, Thorpe turned the tables on him. Sure did. At one point, Thorpe had a 92-yard touchdown run called back by penalty, and on the next play, ran for a 97-yard touchdown. Carlisle won the game 27-6 and went on to win the college national championship. But Thorpe later remembered Eisenhower as a good linebacker. Eisenhower remembered Thorpe as the greatest football player he ever saw. Uh, Eisenhower was the only president to go head-to-head -head with the world's greatest athlete. And he barely lived to tell the tale. Yeah, the de, you know the Olympic decathlon winner is, I think, traditionally called the greatest athlete in the world. Jim Thorpe, multiple sport athlete. He played Major League Baseball, I think, in football. Like, yeah, obviously, he was, he was total badass, badass yeah. totally dominant. Young Dwight Eisenhower going head-to-head -head with him, standing on the highest stages of f certainly football at the time, this yeah. pre-NFL, right? the Carlisle Indian School, I think was undefeated and won the national championship that year. They're the best football team in the world. Our future president holding his own a little yeah. bit. Eisenhower would become a football coach on Army bases and uh, – Many people compared his leadership style as a general to a football coach. Hmm. He would write, I believe that football, perhaps more than any other sport, tends to instill in men the feeling that victory comes through hard, almost slavish work, team play, self-confidence, and an enthusiasm that amounts to dedication. Eisenhower was also an avid golfer throughout his presidency and usually scored in the 80s. Pretty in good. 1968, of course... He made a legendary hole-in-one at the Seven Lakes Country Club. Yeah. One of his life's proudest achievements, right up there with defeating the Nazis, got there's a hole-in-one. Sunk that hole-in-one. And that's going to bring us right up to top five most athletic president. Number four. Abraham Lincoln. Now, our 45th president may be in the WWE Hall of Fame, but it's our 16th president who is the true wrestling legend. Young Honest Abe was six foot four, weighed in at 214 pounds, and he possessed a great strength honed through hard work with an axe, earning his later nickname the Rail Splitter. Yeah. I think that'd be his wwe that finishing be, move yeah the rail splitter <laughs> yeah, that would be. good god good god almighty lincoln got him with the rail splitter he's killed him it's over he's dead solid finishing maneuver at age 22 lincoln lived in the hardscrabble frontier town of new salem illinois where men had to be tough 
and physical strength was valued, the neighboring town of Clary's Grove had a wild gang of roughnecks led by Jack Armstrong, a bull of a man, mm. and a showdown developed when Lincoln got a job in a store owned by Denton Offit. Here's the story as told by David Herbert Donald in his classic Lincoln biography. Highly recommended book, mm. by the way. When Offit, enchanted with his new assistant, began boasting that Lincoln was not merely the smartest man in New Salem, but also the strongest, the Clary's Grove boys called his bluff. They cared not at all about Lincoln's mental superiority, but they dared him to test his strength in a wrestling match with their champion, Jack Armstrong. Lincoln was reluctant because he said he did not like all the wooling and pooling of a wrestling match, but the urging of his employer and the taunts of his rivals obliged him to fight. In the collective memory of New Salem residents, the contest was an epic one, and various versions survived. How Armstrong defeated Lincoln through a trick, how Lincoln threw Armstrong, how Armstrong's followers threatened to collectively lick the man who had defeated their champion until Lincoln volunteered to take them all on one at a time. Wow. The details were irrelevant. What mattered was that Lincoln proved that he had immense strength and courage, and that was enough to win the admiration of the Clary's Grove gang. Thereafter, they became Lincoln's most loyal and enthusiastic admirers. That's pretty badass. No. Standing up for himself. And, like, he was nothing to laugh at. I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that's... six foot four, 214 pounds. Like, yeah, he was, he was wiry. Yeah. I'll bet. He was tough. My he was. God. There's another story told by Carl Sandberg. A crowd was watching two other men wrestle when Lincoln asserted his dominance and his willingness to take on all comers. Quote, the ring of the crowd was broken when Abe shouldered his way through, stepped out and took hold of one wrestler and threw him out of the center of the <laughs> fight ring. Then, so they said, Abe Lincoln called out, I'm the big buck of this lick. Wow. His eyes sweeping the circle of the crowd he challenged. If any of you want to try it, come on and wet your horns. Strong words from a strong man. That's Lincoln, man. Absolutely. A wrestling is. champion. I think he he was supposedly undefeated as a wrestler for a long time. Then I think it was during the Black Hawk War. He went up against yeah. someone else who beat him. He later told the story that he had been an undefeated wrestler until he fought a big grizzly of a man, as he put it. Yeah. But yeah, uh, there, I think in uh, John Ford's Young Lincoln with Henry Fonda, I'm pretty sure there is like that scene yeah. where he wrestles. Uh, that fella. Yeah, just like, you know, Eisenhower on the football field, Lincoln in the wrestling ring, a yeah. good proving ground for young men who will go on to excel. That's for sure. And that's going to bring us to top five presidential athlete. Number three. George Herbert Walker Bush. Bush grew up in a family that strove for competitive excellence, and sports were considered an important character-building arena. Bush went far in athletics, becoming the captain of the Yale baseball team and playing in the first two College World Series. Bush idolized Lou Gehrig as the ideal sportsman and followed in the footsteps of the Iron Horse by starting every game during his three-year career, even if he had to play through injury. He played first base and was the team's best fielder. The Associated Press once called him a fielding artist. He was an average hitter but developed more power in his senior year. In one game, he had a single, a double, a triple, scored two runs, and had three RBIs. He later recalled that some scouts approached him as he left the field. However, that was the first and last nibble he ever got from the pros. He never achieved his dream of playing in the major leagues, but three of his Yale teammates did, and nine played in the minors. Bush held his own alongside these world-class athletes and served as their captain. He led his team to the College World Series in 1947 and 1948, and though they unfortunately lost both times, the opposing coach said of Bush, he was an excellent fielder and a tough out. I'd put him on my all-time opponent team. During his senior year, Bush got to meet the great Bambino himself, mm -hmm. Babe Ruth. 
He later recalled, Meeting Babe Ruth on Yale Field was a thrill that stays with me to this day. He was cancer-riddled. His voice was more of a croak than a normal voice, but he radiated greatness, and I was privileged to have been asked to go out to home plate with him to receive his papers that he denoted to Yale. Bush was also an avid skydiver. He first parachuted in the Navy in 1944, but after his presidency, he took it up as a hobby. He was something of a daredevil. Yeah. Old George H. Dub. He celebrated his 75th birthday by jumping out of an airplane and did the same for every fifth birthday thereafter, up to and including his 90th birthday. He was basically confined to a wheelchair, but yeah. that didn't stop him but from, it didn't stop jumping, him from out of a jumping out of a plane. Wow. That takes some gumption. Mm -hmm. And speaking of gumption, wow. we're on to top five most athletic president. Number two. Theodore Roosevelt. Diagnosed with asthma as a young boy, Roosevelt determined to overcome his physical weakness through intense training. Yeah, we have to, we have to say, and it should be. Ab absolutely stressed that he was a frail, sick, weakly boy. Yeah, with but he bad eyesight, mm -hmm. and he he had some things to overcome. Yeah, he didn't didn't accept that as his lot, and was determined to work through it. He started going to the gym every day for a strenuous bodybuilding regimen, and he took up boxing. He and his brother, quote, took delight in blackening each other's eyes in boxing matches. TR was known to possess, quote, a wicked right hand. He went to Harvard in 1879. He entered the Harvard Athletic Association's Boxing Championship, hoping to impress his future wife, Alice, who was in attendance. In the semifinals... He easily defeated his opponent, W.W. W. Coolidge, who had already see, received, quote, a tremendous thrashing from T.R. the previous year. Oof. But in the finals, T.R. faced the defending champion, C.S. Hanks, who had a much longer reach and better eyesight. T.R. had to fight without his glasses. Right. A spectator recalled the legendary match. We witnessed more than a spirited contest. Owing to an innocent mistake of Mr. Hanks, we saw that prophetic flash of the Roosevelt that was to come. Time was called on a round, Roosevelt dropped his guard, and Hanks landed a heavy blow on his nose which spurted blood. Loud hoots and hisses from the gallery and floor were set up, whereat Roosevelt's arm was instantly flung out to command silence. It's all right, he assured us eagerly. He didn't hear him. With bleeding nose, he walked up to Hanks and shook hands with him. Hanks said good-naturedly, Hadn't we better stop? Roosevelt shook his head like a terrier, bared his teeth, and began punching again. The rest of the bout was, quote, distinctly gory. <laughs> wow. It was plain that the smaller Roosevelt was outclassed. It was no fight at all, one student remembered. You should have seen that little fellow staggering about, banging the air. Hanks couldn't put him out, and Roosevelt wouldn't give up. It wasn't a fight, but, oh, he showed himself a fighter. Oh, he was a scrapper. He certainly know? was. I mean, he, 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 maybe he lacked some of the technical skill of, this, of Hanks, but, uh, my God, he hung in there. He took a licking. Yeah. For TR, fighting, though, was not just a young man's game. As New York governor... He would wrestle several times a week with the nation's middleweight wrestling champion, just for exercise. He had to give up wrestling, though, after he broke two ribs and separated a shoulder. He switched back to boxing. Teddy Roosevelt boxed in the White House as a sitting president. Yeah. He wrote in his autobiography, While president, I used to box with some of the aides. After a few years, I had to abandon boxing as well as wrestling, for in one bout, a young captain of artillery cross-countered me on the eye, and the blow smashed the little blood vessels. Fortunately, it was my left eye, but the sight has been dim ever since, and if it had been the right eye, I should have been entirely unable to shoot. Wow. 
Accordingly, I thought it better to acknowledge that I had become an elderly man and would have to stop boxing. I then took up jujitsu for a year or two. Yeah, so that's <laughs> that's his decision. It's like, well, you need to tone I, it down. I got, got kind of like partially blinded in my left eye, so mm. I shouldn't box anymore. Oh, I know, jujitsu. Yeah, as as <laughs> one would, you know. He was also a big game hunter, mountain climber, naturalist, and explorer. Traveler. <laughs> Explorist. <laughs> <laughs> Upon leaving the White House, he went on a year-long African safari where his expedition collected over 11,000 animal specimens for the Smithsonian. In 1913-14, he went on a grueling five-month expedition into the uncharted Brazilian rainforest. Yeah, and he, he nearly died. This nearly yeah. did him in, but my God, tenacity. Mm -hmm. It could have been tenacity He was the T in Indeed. TR. He suffered a leg wound that got infected. He became delirious with a 103-degree tropical fever while also suffering... Severe chest pains from the would-be assassin's bullet still lodged in his chest. Yep. Yeah, uh, as our listeners will recall, episode four's top five failed assassin number two, John Shrank. Yeah. Three other members of the expedition died, but TR powered through and made it home, losing 50 pounds in the process. One of the most epic feats of physical endurance by a president. Absolutely. Hands down. Just raw strength in that man. Total badassery. Absolutely. And that's going to bring us to top five presidential athlete. Number one. Gerald Ford. President Ford was unfairly saddled with the reputation of being clumsy when he fell down some stairs on camera. That baseless smear obscures his well-deserved place as the most athletic president in American history. Ford was the star captain of his high school football team and attracted the attention of college recruiters. He went to the University of Michigan, go blue, where he played center, linebacker, and long snapper. In 1932 and 1933, Ford helped lead the Wolverines to two consecutive undefeated seasons and national championship titles. In the senior year of 1934, however, the team won only one game, but they voted for their MVP because they felt Jerry was one guy who would stay and fight in a losing cause. That year, they played heavily favored Minnesota, the eventual undefeated national champion, and valiantly held them scoreless in the first half. An assistant coach recalled, when I walked into the dressing room at halftime, I had tears in my eyes, and I was so proud of them. Ford and Cedric Sweet played their hearts out. They were everywhere on defense. Ford later recalled, During 25 years in the rough-and-tumble world of politics, I often thought of my experiences before, during, and after that game in 1934. Remembering them has helped me many times to face a tough situation, take action, and make every effort possible despite adverse odds. Ford became the only future president to tackle a Heisman Trophy winner when he took down Chicago's Jay Berwinger and was left with a bloody cut and a scar for his trouble. Ford was on the 1935 college all-star team that played at Soldier Field against the Chicago Bears, who squeaked out a 5-0 win. After college, Ford received offers from the Detroit Lions and Green Bay Packers to play in the NFL. He turned them down and decided to go to law school at Yale, where he served as an assistant football coach. Michigan later retired Ford's number 48. When he was president, he often had the band play Hail to the Victors instead of Hail to the Chief, which is just dope. In my Michigan opinion. fight song. The best fight song in college football. Ford joined the Navy in 1942, where he served as a physical fitness instructor and athletic director before fighting in the Pacific Theater of World War II. As president, he was still in good physical shape and regularly engaged in swimming, skiing, golf, and tennis. I want to go back to Ford's time at Michigan, because uh, people might say, why is Gerald Ford number one? Why isn't Teddy Roosevelt number one? It's not only Ford's skill as a footballer, but his character. 
And we're going to talk about a game against Georgia Tech. Yeah. Where Willis Ward, who was the first person of color to play college football in, I think it was almost 40 years. Yeah. And he was on Michigan. And Georgia Tech said that they would not play the game if Michigan played Willis Ward. The racist Georgia Tech team. Yeah, and Ford threatened to walk. He threatened to quit the team Mm -hmm. if they didn't play him. Michigan decided to back down, but Ford, after a personal talk with Willis Ward, who asked him to play, yeah. Despite that, he played. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a so pretty. So he stood up. It's a brave you know, stand to take. That's a in very brave stand. Nineteen thirty-four. Yeah, that's incredible. And that really says a lot about Gerald Ford's character yeah. as a human being as well right. as an athlete. So yeah. Oh, I think he's all around. Yeah. I think he's number one on the list because he had offers to play in the NFL. Yeah. This president, like, legitimately could have been a professional athlete. Right. Although this was, you know, like the pre Super Bowl era, yeah, I don't sure. think that, playing that in the be, NFL wasn't that would be 30 as years later, but still as lucrative a prospect as it is I mean, today. You still have but, legendary footballers from that era. Yeah, and, he was you know, top world class. Yeah, Ford was a top notch footballer and remains so. And I have seen the footage of when his b- body was flown back to Ann Arbor and the band. The Michigan band was mm-hmm. there and played Hail to the Victors as yeah. they brought him off the plane. It was pretty, pretty awesome. It's a proud Wolverine to the Absolutely. last. You know, go blue, bleed blue and maize for the rest of your days. <laughs> Jerry Ford, our number one presidential athlete. Yep, that top five makes me want to get out and do some calisthenics. That's right. I'm going to be hitting some Harvard steps. I'm going to be doing the wheel. We're going to make Jerry Ford proud. That's right. And we could return in peak physical condition for the next episode of the Dead Presidents Podcast.